The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Trauma Verification's April Q&A Web Conference. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items with you. When you joined today's presentation, you had the option of listening to today's presentation via your telephone or your computer speaker system. For best sound quality, we do recommend dialing in and listening through your telephone. To switch to telephone, please select phone call in your audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. I would now like to introduce Megan Hudgens, Trauma Verification Program Coordinator. Hi everybody, Megan Hudgens here. I am one of the program coordinators for the VRC and uh, thank you guys so much for joining us for our webinar today. So just to quickly introduce some of our VRC staff, uh, Tammy Morgan is not present today, but uh, Molly Lozada is in the room um, and, and may step in if she feels the need to, but otherwise the presentation today is going to be left to myself and also my co-coordinator, Bumi Parikh, who will be coming in for the general questions in a few minutes. So a few notes on continuing education credits. To qualify for CE, you must attend at least 50 minutes of educational content. An email will be sent to all attendees who qualify for CE within 24 hours of the webinar ending with instructions on how to claim CE. And if you have any questions about this, please do feel free to email us at cotvrc at facs.org. So what's the goal for this webinar? So to, firstly, to interpret the standards outlined in the Resources for Optimal Care of the Injured Patient Manual to ensure that hospitals have an understanding of the criteria to provide quality care to the injured patient. And also, secondly, to understand the processes and standards involved in an ACS trauma, ver trauma verification site visit and how following these will positively impact the quality of care of the injured patient at your trauma center. So let's get started. Firstly, the Orange Resources book. Uh, so this is available as a hard copy or a PDF version. We highly recommend that you have this available as reference during the CD related questions section of this webinar and just have a copy available in general. It'll uh, help as a reference while you're listening in. We also uh, recommend that you use the most current clarification document and verification change log in conjunction with the manual and there is a link to those below. And on the subject of the clarification document and verification change log, these are released monthly. The change log is going to be notes about any criteria changes or updates, and the clarification document is just explanations and elaborations of the criteria. And again, the link is on the slide. So website resources for trauma centers, and I wanted to uh, focus in on this for a minute. For any recordings of past webinars, and we do have a few years worth of webinars for you to review. Um, you can see the link attached in the slide. Also, a stakeholder public comment website for chapter revisions. Uh, please feel free to take a look at that link as well. Uh, for more directed tutorials, we also have two, uh, Becoming a Verified Trauma Center First Steps and Becoming a Verified Trauma Center Site Visit. Uh, also, for the Participant Hub, uh, so one thing that we wanted to address is that as you are adding contact for uh, your account in the Participant Hub, we do strongly ask that you add one in for your administrative contact, your CEO, COO, whoever your administrative contact is going to be. There's not really a, a convenient way in the system to, there, there's not like a category specifically for CEO or COO. We would usually just ask that you put them, like um, put the person's name and then in parentheses put CEO. We do send a copy of the uh, final site visit letter and report to that administrative contact as well. So we just want to have an accurate contact on file. And also we have a copy of the expanded FAQ uh, which is linked at the bottom of the slide. So a quick disclaimer, all questions are pulled directly from the question submissions. There have been no edits made to the contents. And if your question is not answered today, the question may require more information. So we will be uh, reaching out to you within one week of the webinar to just get any elaborations that we need before we answer that question. And scheduling reminders. So these will be presented every other month to avoid any redundancies. Uh, the next presentation uh, of scheduling reminders will be uh, May 2019's webinar. 
and a few quick announcements. So speaking of the May webinar, uh, the next webinar date is going to be Thursday, May 30th, uh, again at uh, 12 p.m. Central Time. So your deadline to submit questions is going to be Friday, May 10th. And I'm going to start off with a quick PRQ question and uh, just some elaboration on uh, some uh, recurring things that we noticed, some challenges with the PRQ. So uh, we try to bring this up every now and again uh, with the Section 2 data tables since there's some confusion about what should line up and what shouldn't. Uh, so uh, you'll see the color-coded uh, entries on each of the different tables. These are the items that should line up. You will notice as you are reading the tables that there are a few color-coded ones that don't line up, specifically the black squares for admitted ED trauma visits regardless of service. Uh, so one thing to note is if they don't match up perfectly, that is totally fine. There is an entry in the PRQ where you can explain any discrepancies, and we encourage you to use that. Uh, also important to note that direct admissions may or may not factor into how you fill this out. Um, typically, when we're reading through the PRQ, if we notice that the only difference is those direct admissions, like the sum of those direct admissions, we generally assume that's, what the dif that's where the difference comes from. Uh, one important thing to note is the highlighted boxes in red, uh, so number, of the, number admitted to trauma service. One area where we um, see mistakes here is in that last table for table 11. A lot of people assume that because uh, number admitted to trauma service falls after column 2, total number of deaths from admissions by ISS, that we're looking for an ISS breakdown of deaths uh, that were trauma service admissions. We're actually looking for an ISS breakdown of all trauma service admissions. So just to keep in mind, um, that number should add up to the trauma service, trauma service admissions in Table 7. And then also, uh, as you're filling out the non-surgical admissions table, just be sure in that ISS breakdown that the sum total of that first row that's highlighted in green matches the non-surgical admissions in Table 7. And here's another quick question on PRQ, specifically data validation. Wondering what the difference is on the PRQ questions 11 and 12 from chapter 15. And just reading through those quickly for number 11, are there strategies for monitoring data validity for trauma registry? And explain uh, number 12, describe the registry data validation process used by the center. Understand 12 well, but not sure what they're looking for in question 11. So specifically, the question is asking how or what the processes are in place to validate uh, trauma registry data. One example of this uh, could be you may have registry software that does data validation, uh, validation checks on data fields. Uh, how often are you performing data validation to ensure information being put into the charts is accurate and complete? How often is data validation done on closed charts to ensure that re the required data is being captured is accurate or uh, to catch any registrar errors? There's various ways that you can do this, and uh, as far as uh, you know, uh, how we want you to fill out the PRQ, we mostly just want to know how it's being done at your center. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to my colleague, Bumi Parikh, who is going to uh, move us through the general questions. All right, hi everyone. I'm going to be presenting the general questions for this month's webinar. Lots of great questions for this month. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first question is 23 hour admissions. What category does less than 23 hours go to if not admission for EE disposition? So specifically for verification and completion of the PRQ, if length of stay is less than 23 hours and the patient was not admitted to the trauma or non-surgical service, this would not be counted toward the total trauma admissions. So as indicated in the slide um, that Megan just went over a few seconds ago, um, it would be reportable in the ED disposition table under discharged. Um, sometimes the trauma center may have a unique code or a customized audit filter to identify these patients within the trauma registry. And then as a reminder, trauma admissions are patients who meet the NTDS inclusion criteria and have a length of stay greater than 24 hours to a surgical or non-surgical service. Hospice. Um, we have two questions on hospice this month. Uh, the first question is, the hospice deaths are reviewed up to transfer to hospice. Do they need to be categorized as deaths too? 
with the new requirement to review patients discharged to hospice in our mortality reviews, should we also be reviewing patients discharged home or to skilled nursing facility on comfort care, but who are not necessarily on a hospice program? So to clarify, this is not a new requirement. Uh, what we would like programs to do for verification purposes is to review those patients that were discharged or transferred to an inpatient unit or to an external hospice facility or comfort care. So the basic expectation is that the care of the patient leading up to the transfer or discharge was evaluated through the PIPS process by the TMD and TTM. And then within this, if there are any issues that were filed, uh, it would be reviewed at peer review. So this is also mentioned on the clarification document um, for CD 16-6. Does a trauma surgeon have to see a level three isolated hip fracture? So um, if we understand this, this question correctly, uh, level three activation is um, the consultation tier. So um, if the question is, does a trauma surgeon have to see a patient with an isolated hip fracture during the consultation tier? So the answer is, it depends, because the policy uh, for when the trauma surgeon is expected to see trauma, trauma patients will be defined by the institution. Do non-surgical admissions without trauma consult count in the alcohol screening expert requirements? Yes, the trauma patients that are admitted greater than 24 hours would be subject to the alcohol screening and expert requirement. So this is as per CD 18-3. Um, which antibiotic times for open fractures does the ACS want collected? So, i.e., only ortho or skull fractures and nasal bones as well. And another similar question was, can you discuss the requirements to report first antibiotic for open fractures? Is this only for open fractures only or others like complex nasal fractures also considered open? So, uh, the PRQ requirement is only for the orthopedic tibial shaft fractures. So, please don't include any other fractures such as ankle, pylon amputations, plateaus, skull, nasal, et cetera. Should we be tracking all attendings arrival times, such as ortho, um, trauma, and neuro? And how do you recommend tracking and documenting the time? So yes, your center must track all attending travel arrival times. Um, but following the release of the VRC uh, resources manuals, the chair is permitted self-reporting. Uh, however, as a best practice, it would be uh, ideal to have a scribe or a bad scanning system for this requirement. So the next question is on trauma surgeon backup call coverage. So the question is, with the understanding that the primary attending must be dedicated to one center and we must have a backup call schedule published, does that provider for backup call need to be dedicated to one center or can he and she cover two centers if there's a third tier to the backup call schedule to have someone respond if that person happens to the B in the OR at this other center. And then this is for a level one pediatric center. So yes, this is definitely an acceptable practice. So the backup trauma surgeon does not need to be dedicated to one facility as long as the center has a third backup surgeon or as noted in this scenario, a third tier. So the next question is on, um, neurosurgery consult. So if GCS is 13 or less and trauma surgeon and a mid-level NP, PA, respond to neuro consult, can telemedicine evaluation be done by a neurosurgeon? So it's dictated, subsequently be, satisfa be satisfactory. Uh, if the GCS is less than 13, would be in-person neurosurgery consult. Uh, so no, the VRC does not approve of telemedicine in lieu of an in-person consultant at bedside. So the neurosurgery, neurosurgery NP, PA, may respond to neurosurgical consults if there are established guidelines in place for when they can respond. Uh, following the evaluation, it would be acceptable for the trauma surgeon and or neuro NP, PA to discuss the plan of care with the attending neurosurgeon by telemedicine. Uh, and then again, this must all be documented. The next question is on the PI coordinator. So does the PI person have to be a nurse? For example, we have one PI nurse coordinator and are looking to acquire a second for support. So to clarify, the VRC does not have any requirements for a PI coordinator position. 
Um, therefore, this position can technically be filled by a qualified co a candidate as determined by your trauma center. Um, combined pediatric program staffing requirements. This is a great question. Um, could an adult level two also become a pediatric level two with a TPM for each program and a single director overseeing both programs? Another similar question that we had on this was, does an adult in pediatric level two require a completely separate registry, <clears throat> injury prevention, and PI staff, or does that depend on program volumes? So, um, Adult level two with pediatric level two verified programs may share many of the same resources, such as the TMD, TPM, injury prevention coordinators, PI coordinator staff, and the registry. Um, however, the TMD and TPM are crucial to a trauma program. Uh, therefore, these positions should be monitored to ensure they are not encumbered from performing their daily duties. So basically, yes, um, this can be the case, especially if the volumes are um, like if the adult and peds program are high volume and uh, therefore they would require two separate um, TMDs and two separate TPMs depending on the volume. The next question is on TAG. So need clarification on TAG. The book says TAG should be available at level one and two centers, but our TMD feels it is a CD. So no, no, this is not a deficiency at all. Uh, thromboplastography should be available at level one and two centers, but definitely not required. Um, the next question is, should trauma be seeing every level two or every tier two activation, such as falls with subdural hematomas, isolated hip fractures, or just a surgical service? So for the, le for the limited tier activations, the trauma center must determine the criteria for patients who require an evaluation by the trauma surgeon. Uh, for example, if your center has established, or I'm sorry, um, the site reviewers will confirm that this institution adheres to its own criteria and that these criteria are routinely evaluated by the PITS process. Uh, the next question is, our trauma center will admit any pediatric patients does the, trauma, does the surgeon have to evaluate the high-level activation pediatric patient prior to transfer? For the highest level of activation, the trauma surgeon is required to respond within 30 minutes from patient arrival, and that's a CD. Uh, we certainly do not want to delay care if the patient has been stabilized and is ready to be transported before the trauma surgeon arrives. As always, these occurrences should be documented and monitored through the PICS process. The next question is, uh, the attending surgeon needs to be present within 30 minutes. I thought it was 20 minutes, please clarify. In level one and two trauma centers, the acceptable response time for the highest level activation tracked from patient arrival is 15 minutes, uh, and then 30 minutes for level three trauma centers. For the limited tier, each institution will develop its own criteria for when the attending surgeon is required to be present in the emergency department. For example, if your center has established a 20 or 30 minute response time for this tier, the reviewers will confirm that the institution adheres to its own criteria and that these criteria are routinely evaluated by the PITS process. The next question is on transfer outs and depth. We use the NTDB inclusion criteria for our trauma volume requirement. Do we need to exclude transfer outs and ED deaths? So for verification purposes, if the transfer out and or ED deaths were admitted as trauma patients to the hospital, they would be included in the volume requirement. But if the transfer outs and or ED deaths occurred prior to being admitted as trauma patients to the hospital, then no, they would not be counted in the volume requirement. So another question was on upgrading from a level three to a level two. So definitely a great question. Uh, so the question was, can you highlight the main focuses when transiting from um, a level three to a level two? So for this, we, the VRC would recommend using the change log document to do a gap analysis. So since the change log is on an Excel file, um, you can easily filter by the level and see which CD is applicable to each level. 
so uh, we have some of the few of the major focuses um, that are required listed on this slide. For instance, um, a highest activation trauma duration response time is 15 minutes compared to 30 minutes in a, lo in a level three. Um, surgical specialists are uh, required in person when consulted. There's a CME requirement for TMDs and TPMs. A backup call schedule for trauma surgery is required. Um, ED physicians are required in, in the emergency department at all times. Um, and then there's also neurosurgery requirements. Uh, the anesthesiologist is required to be in-house, and then the OR staff has to be, um, the OR has to be staffed within 15 minutes, and then there should also be injury pre prevention efforts, and then uh, pediatric criteria can um, be also included if your center admits pediatric patients. And just to clarify, anesthesia in-house is, um, if, if there's no CRNAs available, then the anesthesiologist would have to be in-house. Um, just wanted to clarify that. Thanks, Molly. Um, so the next question is on level four and level five centers. So we are currently a level four. Does ACS review level four and five centers in Alaska, or is it done by the state? So no, the ACS does not currently conduct site visits for level four and five centers. Um, however, in most states, level four and five reviews are done by the Department of Health. So uh, definitely reach out to your Department of Health um, regarding this information. Um, the next question is, if the TMD is also the treating surgeon who reviews the chart for the, who reviews the chart for the second level of review after the TPM? So definitely a great question. So you can probably just have another trauma surgeon review his or her medical record, or in some instances, centers will send it out for an independent review by their peer who can sometimes uh, be within the same region or in the same health system. When preparing charts for an ACS verification site visit, should the charts only be the last 10 of each category or is it preferred to have charts from the survey year that have been through the PIPS process that meet the criteria in addition to those 10? So what we wanna see is the last 10 charts um, which are the most recent from the reporting year that underwent a PIPS review and also some cases that did not warrant a PIPS review. So as a reminder, during a site, re site visit, uh, reviewers are basically conducting a sampling of your medical rec records. So they'll want to see um, cases that did and did not have a PIPS review. So the whole basic purpose of um, the site visit chart review process is uh, that reviewers can assess the appropriateness of care. Uh, next question is, where can we find a list for chart reviews? I understand that has changed. So no, no changes have been made to the chart review categories at all. Um, so you will receive the review agenda once you receive receipt of the site visit application, and then that will include the categories for the chart review. And then also, this is also included in the VRC resources webpage. How far in advance do you recommend preparing charts for re-verification? Um, so the short answer is this kind of just varies um, based on your center and when charts are closed. So there's no magic number per se, um, but what, we, what we've seen in the past is that CPMs will usually prepare charts 30 to 60 days in advance of the site visit. We are preparing for a consultative level three visit in July. Is there a minimum number of activations required? So for any type of site visit, there's not a minimum number of activations required. However, in level one and two centers, we do have volume specific requirements. Uh, the next question is, historically our trauma program is re-verified in October and our reporting year has always been July to June. This was also our reporting year for our visit in October of 2017. Will the reporting year timeframe of July to June not be adequate for a site visit in October? Our next visit will be October 2020. So I'm trying to see if our reporting year can start July 2019 to June 2020. Um, so the reporting year is defined as 12 months with a two month lag and not older than 14 months from the date more like the month of the visit is scheduled. 
serve for a visit scheduled in the month of October, the appropriate reporting period would be August 1st, 2019 through the end of July, 2020. How do we capture peer review meeting attendance for a trauma surgeon that has been out on extended maternity leave, so seven plus months? Uh, so as mentioned in the clarification document, a waiver is acceptable for medical leave, which in this case is, a, is maternity leave. So if you have a meeting attendance roster, which is whether it's paper or electronic, you can indicate that the trauma surgeon's attendance is waived. So in this instance, you will need to have supporting documentation during the site visit for the reviewers to review. Does peer review only apply to the PIPS meeting? So generally speaking, the term peer review meeting is synonymous with the performance improvement and safety program meeting, which is the PIPS meeting. Some centers may have a different name for these meetings, which is acceptable. However, the main agenda is to review medical cases or opportunities for improvement. Uh, the last question for general questions is, uh, will the performance improvement coordinator position be in the new orange book as a required position for level one centers? And the similar question that we got was, are there changes to the neurosurgery response requirements planned? Um, so as mentioned before, any changes will be dis disseminated upon the completion of the entire chapter revision process. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Megan for the CD related questions. Thank you so much, Boomi. Hi, everybody, I'm back. So let's go ahead and get started. So our first question is on CD218 for peer review meetings. What time frame does the ACS COT consider a timely case review? When is a case review considered not timely? Uh, this is referring to CD218. Uh, so CD218, just to clarify, reads as follows. In level one, two, three, and four trauma centers, the multidisciplinary trauma peer review committee must meet regularly with the required attendance of medical staff active in trauma resuscitation to review systematic and care provider issues as well as to propose improvements to the care of the injured. Uh, so this requirement follows in conjunction with uh, two other CDs, 1615 and 1616, and this is in regard to peer review along with attendance from the required providers and how often you should meet to review medical cases. So the intent of timely case review, as we define it here, is uh, th that'll uh, vary by institution and the frequency of those meetings may be impacted by your volume. A uh, level one trauma center with 2,500 admissions is gonna have different needs in this regard than a, a level three with like 400. Uh, there, are definite, there certainly are cases where you'll need to review uh, them sooner rather than later due to any critical issues or opportunities for improvement that may impact patient care or surgeon performance. So moving on to transfers for CD43, uh, for a level three trauma center that will primarily transfer injured pediatric patients, is it acceptable to let the ED physician manage the injured pediatric patient and the surgeon defer judgment to the ED providers? And then another one, is it required that the surgeons evaluate pediatric trauma patients in an adult center prior to transfer? So management of pediatric patients at adult facilities is gonna be based on your trauma center's guidelines. Uh, transfer of a patient should not be delayed while waiting for the attending, attending surgeon, as we covered earlier. If the ED physician communicated with the attending, it would totally be acceptable to transfer. Uh, this practice is not an excuse for the attending surgeon not to respond based on your guidelines. Uh, this, these instances must be documented and reviewed through the PIPS process. So moving on to CD516, uh, Activations Limited Tier. Clarification of CD 516, does trauma surgery APP response meet the trauma surgical evaluation requirement for limited tier activation this is from a level two? Uh, yes, for, uh, for the limited tier, it's acceptable for the APP or the nurse practitioner to be the initial responder based on whatever your institutional criteria might be. Uh, the important thing to note, however, is that they cannot be used in lieu of the attending surgeon's role and their response. And again, for 516, what is the acceptable time response for trauma surgical evaluation for limited tier activations? So again, uh, this would be determined by your institutional criteria. Uh, the ACS really doesn't indicate a strict time requirement for limited tier activations like we do for the highest level of activation. 
however, we do verify that whatever criteria you have set internally, that you are adhering to those criteria. Here's one on bypass and divert. Uh, we have two level two trauma centers in our city, no level one or three. Do we still count divert hours if both hospitals in the city are on divert at the same time? Yes. Uh, so um, both centers would still be required to report, track, and monitor the bypass divert hours, regardless of whether the other facilities in the city are also uh, on divert. And here's one for OPPEs, ED511. Do OPPEs need to be done on all ED providers that might come in contact with trauma patients or only MDs involved in activations? Uh, this is from a level one. So the OPPE will be performed for all providers on the trauma call by their respective director's liaison, such as um, the orthopedic liaison, for example, would conduct the OPPE for members of his or her service that are on the trauma panel. Same with neuro. Same for any other specialty. Uh, the, the TMD would have some oversight over that process, some kind of sign off. And, uh, one for activations for highest level criteria at CD 513. Uh, gunshot wound to extremities proximal to the elbow or knee has been removed from six required criteria. Can the center keep it as is? So yes, this is correct. Um, to uh, clarify for anyone who might be confused, the criteria for gunshot wounds to the neck, chest, or abdomen was amended by removing what originally followed, which was or extremities proximal to the elbow or knee. So we've taken that out. Um, if you have that in your uh, criteria, however, and it's working for you, uh, it is completely acceptable for your trauma center to keep it as part of your activation criteria. The list that we provide for CD513 is, you know, it's the minimum, uh, but your center may certainly include more. And here's another one on admissions for non-surgical CD518. On uh, non-surgical admits, it's acceptable to exclude those you admitted to ortho and same level, uh, same level falls, correct? Once you exclude as above, is, the, is it the total number left that are non-surgical admits in numerator, or is it those reviewed slash deemed appropriate? And this is from a level three. So we're gonna refer you in this case to the table on page 121 of the resources manual. Uh, you also wanna keep in mind that the CD is not that the center admitted more than 10% of non-surgical admissions. That in itself is not uh, the deficiency. The CD would come from not performing a PIPs evaluation on those patients that didn't receive a surgical consult just to determine if they were appropriately admitted. And for best practices, however, all non-surgical admissions should be reviewed. And I just wanna add something really quick. I know this, um, the subject of non-surgical admissions comes up very frequently um, in our webinars, and I understand there's a lot of interpretations of what a non-surgical um, or what we expect of the non-surgical uh, patients and how reviewers um, review those. And I just want to let you all know that I am working on a presentation um, that uh, hopefully will provide some guidance and understanding of how um, these um, set of patients um, um, or what they mean, the definition for them and what the reviewers are expecting for these types of patients. So I hope to have that out in the very near future. I would say within the next month or so, I'll have that. And we will definitely send out a news uh, email in the news and the email that we send out about the newsletter, send something out to let you know that that's gonna be up and ready. Um, and also we'll do it here on, um, announce it during our webinar. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Molly. Special guest star, Molly Lozada, everybody. So, uh, moving on to TPM experience, CD523. Uh, the TPM must show evidence of clinical experience in the care of injured patients. Please explain how to show the evidence. Uh, so, without clinical knowledge and experience in trauma care, leading initiatives uh, that would be critical to TPM positions, such as PIPs projects, participating in peer review for physicians and nurses, developing practice management guidelines, all these would be a lot more challenging. Uh, so the following represents a list of qualifications for the TPM that we would be checking for. Uh, they, uh, firstly, that he or she must have 12 hours of trauma-related continuing education per year. 
Uh, the TPM work, uh, must work collaboratively with the TMD. This is, a, this is essential. Uh, the philosophy of the TMD and TPM must be in sync, otherwise the program may suffer. Uh, or, uh, organizes services and systems for a multidisciplinary approach to trauma care, and also the TPM should be uh, leading the day-to-day -day PIPs processes and ensuring that timely identification, review, and loop closure are occurring. And moving on to CD69 regarding ATLS for trauma surgeons and intensivists. Is ATLS required for a surgeon slash intensivist who only provides coverage of the trauma ICU? So uh, all board certified general and trauma surgeons caring for trauma patients must have completed the ATLS course at least once as per CD69. Intensivists, however, we don't actually have a standard for the intensivists to require ATLS certification. So that does not factor into CD69. So moving on to neurosurgery call, schedule, and backup as per CDs 83 and 85. Uh, CD83, please clarify. The PRQ is a yes, no for this CD, but the clarification document offers other options. Uh, so to clarify, uh, if there's not a dedicated neurosurgery coverage at the institution, there has to be a backup call schedule in place, a published backup call schedule. Uh, if dedicated neurosurgery coverage is present, then you do have some options there. You can either have a published backup call schedule or a contingency plan. And if you do uh, go the contingency plan route, there are a few um, criteria that that has to meet, uh, which are listed as follows. A credentialing process to allow the trauma surgeon to provide initial evaluation and stabilization of the neurotrauma patient, transfer agreements with a similar or higher level verified trauma center, direct contact with the accepting facility to arrange for expeditious transfer or ongoing monitoring support, and monitoring of the efficacy of the process by the PIPS program. If you're going that route and you are filling out the neurosurgery section of the PRQ, all of those have to be checked off, otherwise it will flag a CD in our system. Uh, but uh, important to note that the PRQ is programmed to work in conjunction with CDs 83 and 85. Okay. Moving on to orthopedic surgeon consult. Uh, for a level three consult to ortho for a hip fracture, how long does the ortho surgeon have to arrive, have to arrive at bedside? Uh, so this is gonna depend on the, resource, the response criteria that's set by your facility for the set of patients and their injuries. And as per CD97, the orthopedic surgeon must respond within 30 minutes based on institutional criteria and their adherence to institutional criteria is what the reviewers will be verifying. Here's a question on volume for pediatric trauma. Uh, is there a pediatric volume requirement for an adult level one or two facility to become a pediatric level one or two facility? Uh, so yes, uh, for a center to be verified as a pediatric trauma center, the following are required based on the level. Uh, so for a level one pediatric trauma center, you have to admit more than uh, 200 or more injured children younger than 15 years annually, and that ties to CD101. And then for a level two facility, uh, you just have to admit 100 or more injured children younger than 15 years annually, as per CD-102. And here's one for anesthesia, service, anesthesia services, CRNAs. Uh, can a CRNA cover call for the OR without an anesthesiologist on site? So uh, we're gonna refer you to the clarification document in this case. In level three facilities, operative anesthesia may be provided by a CRNA under, on, um, under on-site physician supervision. Uh, the specialty of the supervising physician should follow state and local slash institutional practices. In states where CRNAs are licensed to practice independently, CRNAs should follow local or institutional practices and may not require physicians. So a uh, question on operating room team. Uh, what does the ACS define as complete operating room team? which members comprise the complete team. Uh, so to clarify the standard, it reads as an operating room must be adequately staffed. So we get the question a lot, well, what does adequately staffed mean in this case? And it really depends. Uh, this is gonna, like, whatever your operating room team is gonna be is gonna vary by institution. This may include, but is not limited to the following. Uh, this could be an operating room nurse, scrub nurse, surgical tech, surgeon, anesthesiologist, CRNA, et cetera. 
and one on operating room equipment. Uh, is rap a rapid infuser needed in a level three center? Yes. Uh, so we're going to refer you in this case to CD 1119, uh, where it says that all trauma centers must have rapid fluid infusers and then also thermal control equipment and resuscitative fluids, intraoperative radiological, radiologic capabilities, equipment for femur fixation, and equipment for bronchoscopy and gastrointestinal endoscopy. So all of those would need to be in place. So here's a question on peer review attendance for the radiologist. Please clarify CD 1139. Is the liaison required to attend a minimum of 50% of the meetings, or if the combination of attendance between liaison and his or her specific alternate is a minimum of 50% attendance, does this meet the CD? I have a note on the clarification document for CD 711 that says no longer uh, must be the designated liaison has confused the 1139 requirement. So let's, uh, let's clarify that. So the radiologist liaison may have one predetermined alternate, and one is the operative word here. It can't be a different person every time. It has to be one person that is predetermined to uh, attend the peer review meetings in their stead. And then the total of the liaison and alternate combined attendance must add up to 50% or greater. And just to uh, expand from radiology here, uh, the above would be true for all other specialty liaisons, so neuro, ortho, et cetera they can all have one predetermined alternate. So ICU credentialed providers. Is a hospitalist who is credentialed in our ICU allowed to see an admitted ICU trauma patient in place of the intensivist? So yes, this would be fine. A hospitalist credentialed to provide care to trauma patients in the ICU may meet this requirement. And moving on to peer review meeting. Uh, does the ICU liaison have to meet the 50% attendance requirement? to peer review slash multidisciplinary meetings in a level three center. So yes, uh, the ICU liaison or designated alternate as we discussed a few slides back would have to attend a minimum of 50% of all trauma multidisciplinary peer review meetings. Uh, to clarify, since uh, the TMD often serves as the ICU liaison, uh, their attendance would be counted simultaneously. So when you're filling out Appendix 11A um, and you're putting in everybody's attendance percentages, you would just put the same percentage in for TND and ICU liaison if they are filled by the same person. So a uh, question on surgical specialists. Do L2 centers need to have microvascular service and microscope available with on-call schedule? So yes, as per CDs 1170 and 1171, uh, level two centers must have a microvascular surgeon, or if not, uh, coverage may be satisfied by, if you have a surgeon, on staff who uses an operating microscope for nerve repair, free tissue transfer, et cetera. Uh, microvascular capability is not required in-house 24-7. I know that throws a lot of people, uh, but there must be a surgeon consultant available to respond in person when requested by the attending surgeon. Uh, therefore, the name of the surgeon that will be providing coverage for that specialty should be listed on the call schedule. So you should be able to point to a specific person and say this is who is providing microvascular care. So here's one for surgical specialists. Uh, surgical specialty requirements for level two is ophthalmology, urology, et cetera, required 24 hours a day. Uh, so as we were discussing before, uh, coverage by the surgical specialist is not required 24 seven or in-house. Uh, the intent here is that the consultant must be available when a consult is requested based on your center's guidelines. And the reviewers are going to wanna see that provider's name on the call schedule for that service. And again, for surgical specialty, a lot of these today. Uh, for non-essential call coverage like ophthalmology or psych, if our policy states a 48-hour response time, is this acceptable? Uh, yes. So if the response time for ophthalmology, for example, uh, surgical specialists can be uh, based on your institution's policy and guidelines. Uh, as a note, the specialist must be available in person at bedside when a consult is requested by the trauma attending. And uh, just to clarify, uh, since uh, we weren't sure about this in the, the question, but psych is actually not um, a required specialty. So that's not part of the requirement. So just wanted to clear that up. And here's one on registry cases. Regarding trauma registries, 80% of cases must be entered within 60 days of discharge. Does that infer cases must be closed within 60 days or just started and in the registry? So in total, uh, to meet, uh, meet the requirement, CD uh, 
15.6, uh, 15, 80% of charts must be closed within 60 days of the patient being discharged. And moving on to trauma peer review and operations meetings, 16.15, is it possible to have your M&M and your operations meeting all in the same meeting? So if M&M in this case, uh, morbidity and mortality is referring to uh, the peer review meeting, then these meetings should be kept separate since they differ based on requirements. Uh, but the purpose of the multidisciplinary peer review meetings, which requires attendance at minimum 50% by the TMD, uh, all trauma surgeons and liaisons, is to improve trauma care by reviewing selected death cases, complications, and sentinel events with objective identification of issues and op appropriate responses, and minutes for this are required. So where this differ differs from the operational meeting, the operational meeting does not require attendance by the liaisons. Uh, it's typically attended by uh, hospital and medical staff members. The exact format may be hospital specific in which it examines hospital related operations and functions. So uh, nursing education, staff turnover has plummeted our, uh, uh, plummeted our TNCC rates in the ED. I can't find a CD, but our TMD feels there is a CD attached to this. Let me escape your fears. The ACS does not have a requirement regarding TNCC completion. Um, with this said, you must ensure that there is a mechanism available to offer some form of trauma-specific educa uh, trauma education to nurses who care for trauma patients. And um, in regard to the TMD's concern specifically, if nursing education was uh, previously cited as a weakness and continues to be an issue, the review team and or the VRC chairs may elevate this to a CD at the time of the subsequent visit. So here's one on injury prevention FTE. Do a level one adult and PED center each require a full-time injury prevention FTE, or can they share one for both programs? Uh, so yes, uh, an adult a level one trauma center and a pediatric level one trauma center must each have an injury prevention coordinator. Uh, this person must be full-time with a job description and salary support. This person must be separate from the T uh, TPM position. And here's one on alcohol screening. If SBIRT is attempted but not completed due to the patient being comatose or sedated for intubation, does this attempt count? I uh, love this question. So uh, as noted in the clarification document and the verification change log, screening is applicable to eligible patients who are defined as participatory. If the patient is comatose or sedated and unable to respond, they are not participatory. Uh, so these occurrences, however, must be monitored through the PIPs process. So here's another one on alcohol screening for pediatric patients. Uh, in completing alcohol screening on all trauma patients, how is this handled for pediatric patients? Is it required? So the minimum age by which you're going to evaluate um, pediatric patients for alcohol use, th this is gonna be determined by your trauma center. In total though, whatever your institution's criteria are, 80% of patients above that age must receive a screening for alcohol. another one on alcohol screening. Do you have to do an audit C or an alcohol screen on level three consult for isolated hip fractures? So uh, there must be like some kind of a screening tool uh, such as audit C, BAC, consumption questions, etc. on at least 80% of all admitted trauma patients and must be documented. And again on alcohol screening, uh, there's some confusion regarding SBIRT. Can you clarify, please? So to clarify, uh, screening must be conducted on at least 80% of all trauma patients that are admitted uh, for more than 24 hours, and this must be documented in their medical record. Uh, this includes patients admitted to uh, uh, surgical services such as ortho, neuro, and furthermore, the type of screening tool used will be determined by your trauma center, as we discussed before. Uh, while the following is not required for level three trauma centers, all patients within that 80% who screen positive must receive a documented intervention as per CD 18.4. And we're gonna refer you to, in this case to the clarification document and change log for more information. And here's one for research, uh, CDs 19.4 and 19.7. Is there a grace period for implementing new guidance on use of vendors for research, or is it meant to be retroactive? Can we take a hybrid approach 
uh, leverage previous studies and uh, a new go forward, stru go forward structure as we build up to 20 publications. Uh, so this is in reference to the clarification document uh, where we have an excerpt uh, posted below taken from the resources manual in which some are interpreting as new guidelines. Uh, the excerpt and following language were added for uh, additional clarification, uh, but to answer the question, no grace period will be granted. And moving on to, uh, we just have a few more on CME. Uh, so CME documentation. Do we have to provide copies, CME, or maintenance of certification for providers who are board certified in their specialty? such as ED physicians, orthotrauma physicians, trauma surgeons, et cetera. And also at verification time, evidence of CME must be provided for TND, TPM, all surgeons, all ED providers. So to clarify the CME requirements, uh, for TMD, TPM, and anyone who's previously undergone or will at the time of the site visit be going through the alternate pathway, it is required to have copies of their CMEs available at the time of the site visit. So the reviewers will want to see those. Uh, for all other panel members taking trauma calls, such as uh, trauma surgeons, neurosurgeons, orthopedic surgeons, emergency medicine, et cetera, et cetera, uh, documentation validating their active participation in maintenance of certification will suffice. And one more on CME. Uh, emergency medicine are no longer required any CME. So to clarify, uh, only EM physicians who have undergone or are currently undergoing review by the alternate pathway criteria are required to present proof of CME. Uh, for all other surgeons, board certification or eligibility is sufficient to meet the criteria. And we just had one quick clarification we wanted to um, put forward from the March webinar. And um, that question regarding direct admits is posted here below. So, to clarify the question regarding transfer of patients with an inpatient status, um, to clarify inpatient, these patients are not required or do not need to be evaluated through the ED at the higher level of care. We just wanted to uh, put that forward since we've gotten some questions about it. And that concludes today's webinar. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us today and have a good rest of your afternoon. And we're gonna hand it back over to Alki to close us out. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Trauma Verification staff, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar, Trauma Verification's April Q&A web conference. If you do have any other questions, please contact cotvrc at facs.org. On behalf of Trauma Verification and our presenters, thank you so much for joining us today and have a great rest of your day.